Welcome to the Longevity Week podcast hosted by the Longevity Forum. We'll be featuring podcasts all week on the theme, Sustainability in a Decade of Healthy Aging, which you can listen to online at thelongevityforum.com. On this episode, Richard Ferger, a professor of biogerontology and board member of the American Federation of Aging Research, will be chatting with James Hull, a principal lecturer at University of Brighton in archeology span and an expert on human evolution. I'll leave the rest to you, Richard. Thank you. Well, James, we're recording this during COP26, and obviously there's a lot of modern concerns about the climate. In your opinion as an archaeologist, was there a better time for us as humans to live than today, climate-wise? Great. Thanks, Richard, and thanks for having me, everyone. Um, That's a really interesting question, because I guess you could take it either way. Um, If we're thinking... Are there, is, has there been a period in the past where temperatures or climate has been warmer than today? Then the answer is yes. So the Earth sort of has gone through natural cycles of what we call interglacials, which are warm periods, and glacials, which are cold periods. So glacials think ice age, um, ice sheets across much of the northern hemisphere. Uh, interglacials are where we are today. And there's been a number of these throughout kind of geological time. But in the last kind of 130,000 years or so, there was there's an interglacial period called MIS, that's Marine Isotope Stage 5, which is sort of subdivided because in a complicated climatic record, there are also peak warm periods and then cool periods in what is generally termed an interglacial. But in in MIS Stage 5, so about 123,000 years ago, the kind of the the world was about two degrees warmer than today, uh, and sea level was about four to six meters higher than it is today. So what that kind of means is that in Britain and Northwest Europe, for example, you've got hippos and these kind of savanna dwelling animals uh, swimming in the Thames or what would be the Thames today, and in Africa, uh, the, the Sahara and and other parts of the Middle East were, were were much greener. So they have wooded grasslands and large mega lakes. So in the past, there have been warmer temperatures than there have been today. I guess the kind of key question that concerns us is how much has human activity in the last 200 years or so impacted on that natural rhythm of interglacial glacial cycle movement? Hmm. It's a, it is an, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question, the extent to which human activity is affecting the climate. I think most people now would agree that it is, and the arguments are about the extent to which it's doing so. Yeah. Um, One of the things that I find fascinating is the idea of hippos in the Thames. Were there any of our ancestors in what would become Great Britain able to see that going on, or had humans not spread that far north yet? Yeah, so that's a, another really great question. So if we think about Britain specifically, there's about a million years of human activity in, in what is Britain. During that kind of MIS stage 5 E period, that 120, sort of four to 119,000 years ago that I was just talking about, what's interesting there, or generally that kind of broader MIS stage 5 period actually, which is about 130 till about 70,000 years ago, Britain uh, is largely abandoned by people, it seems, Uh, or the number of people in Britain are so small to be almost archaeologically invisible. There's about two artefacts that have come from uh, a a sort of a sub-interglacial phase of that stage five period. So what that means then is that the the populations of northwestern Europe at that time are are Neanderthal. But during that stage five warming period, you know, one idea as to why Britain wouldn't have people in it is that sea levels rose too quickly Uh, at the end of the previous kind of glacial period, MIS stage six, sea levels rose very quickly. So animals got across, but people, but the Neanderthals hadn't kind of moved their way north quickly enough, as it were, to kind of make that leap across the land bridge. It's really kind of intriguing. We do have this very, very small archaeological record. Um, so if they did get here, they really came across some really small numbers, you know, hundreds maybe at, at the maximum, uh, possibly. So effectively, what we have is a few people, something that looks like the African savanna in an ocean of game, which really doesn't sound like too bad a place. But 
I guess it didn't really last because my understanding is that after MIS stage five, the climate got much colder and we entered what most people think of colloquially as the ice age. How long was the freezer on for and what was Europe like and how did people who lived there manage to survive? Yeah, okay. That's that's also a really good question, Richard. Thanks. So after stage five, we enter a glacial period called MIS stage four, and that's from about 71 to about 57,000 years ago so as a cool period. Then we enter another interglacial period, MIS stage three, that's about 57 to 29,000. And MIS stage three is an interglacial period, which is actually quite a cold interglacial period. And in that time in northwest Europe we see the extinction of the Neanderthals and the arrival of our species Homo sapiens in Europe around 40,000 years ago. We then move into what's called the last glacial maximum or MIS stage 2 and that's what probably what most people think of as the last ice age and that dates from about 29, 25,000 years ago to about 15,000 years ago or so. And then after that point we enter the current interglacial stage that we are in, uh, MIS stage one, uh, and that's basically from about 15,000 to, to, to the present day. And the, the Holocene kind of starts around 10,000, 12,000 years ago. Now, in terms of what it was like, um, sort of during the last glacial maximum, um, there are two kind of peak cold periods in, in the Northwest European record. Uh, one is called MIS stage 12, which we call the Anglian glaciation in the UK. That's where most of northwestern Europe is, is under ice. And then the next big ice age, which has a similar impact, but not quite as extensive, is the last glacial maximum, which is MIS stage 2. So Europe is pretty hostile at that point. It's pretty cold. Human populations, Neanderthals are gone now for about 10,000 years. So it is just Homo sapiens in northwest Europe. They seem to have contracted into small localized microclimates sort of regional um re regions of valleys and we, we, where, where the microclimates are a bit warmer than the surrounding areas so we, we call these refugia and typically you find these around southern france uh northern spain uh also uh, uh, places in italy greece and so on and these kind of refugia then are populated by by small numbers of people Potential, you know, our numbers vary here in terms of estimates, but a minimum estimate would be about 5,000. A maximum estimate would be about 100,000. So it's quite a big range, but still relatively small in terms of population wise. So if you think, you know, for Northwest Europe, we're dealing with, even if you take the maximum estimate of 100,000, that's still less people than a large town. Um, it's astonishing that, you know, the, the smallest estimate seems to be uh, the population of Western Europe seems to be fewer people than you would have students at a typical university. Yeah. And the largest estimate for the whole of Western Europe is still less than the population of most towns that most people live in. That, that's absolutely startling. How were these people living? What were they? What was it like? Was it like northern Sweden or Finland? What were they eating? Yeah, so that's a good. Uh, there's sort of a range of subsistence strategies, but basically we're dealing with populations who are hunter gatherers. So they are hunting game, but they're also foraging for uh, plant material. And the game that they hunt will vary depending on their geographic location. And you know, in terms of uh, their latitude, how far north that they are, and you know, sort of, and, and what's, and also the season. So they seem to be seasonal hunters. So they 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 hunt things like reindeer, um, um, deer, uh, auroch, uh, ibex, and places. You know, they, these people will pretty much eat anything that they that they can successfully hunt, and they they kind of make seemingly good use of the whole carcass. So they'll they'll take the flesh for food, but they'll also use the hide for clothing or create shelter. Uh, tents and that sort of thing. Uh, they might use the cartilage to create cordage and their composite tools, so their stone tip spears and that kind of thing. Um, in the same, not the same way, but you know, you can sort of get an insight by using looking at modern ethnographic groups uh, who survive in these kind of in, in these ranges of latitude. But really important to emphasize that modern ethnographic groups are not these kind of Stone Age relics at all. They've undergone their own. Sort of ten thousand years or more of cultural developments and evolution 
uh, in the same way that, uh, that the rest of us have. But they just it's a useful way to kind of get an insight into the types of lifestyles that perhaps were yeah. were, were, were present were possible in the past. Within that. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, it's clear that these are astonishingly resourceful and capable people who are able to survive in an environment that is this harsh. How long did they survive? How much do we know about how, were there any old people? What do we know about the demography of this period? So in all honesty, we don't know very much about the demography of these populations. Um, the skeletal fossil record is very limited and quite fragmentary. And where we've managed to extract a DNA, it's only about 50, 50 specimens where ancient DNA has been extracted. And there's quite some, in, there's quite some interesting hints within that in terms of um, how we've uh, mated with other human species like the Neanderthals and, a, and another species called the Denisovans, uh, which seem to have a range centered further to the east. Um, and, but we don't know how extensive that range was. Um, we certainly, the age structures are, we know very little about. Um, what we do know is in terms of the lifestyles and life ways, most people seem to sort of die around 20. Sort of late teens, early twenties, and that's because it's a very act, active lifestyle. They're hunting quite big game. It's quite dangerous. Uh, it's very rare that we might get individuals aged in the late thirties, maybe early forties. Very, very few uh, individuals there, if, if many at all. And it would be, you know, if you do survive to your kind of mid thirties and late forties, you would really be considered probably old uh, within within that group. Um, so some of the this is the fossil specimens we have who are that old but come from the Neanderthals, for example. Uh, they have lost most of their teeth and the bone has grown over where, where, where the teeth were. And they, they clearly, on, on their skeletals, carry quite significant injuries. So they're being looked after by the rest of the group. Our idea, our knowledge around that for our species, um, sort of 10,000 years later, is, is just we just don't have that, that kind of refinement in the skeletal record to, to, to see that. But most people would kind of you kind of hit your peak in your late teens early 20s and then you're lucky I mean, that, as you survive beyond an, there yeah that's an absolutely fascinating thought because of course it in, and i'm sure we'll come back to this in a couple of ways because it impacts the society in terms of what it can learn you know if the if the median age is 15 in one society and 30 in another mm. that means that on average every member of a society of the of the later median age the greater median age has had 15 years more life experience than someone else and that's going to play out through the society's ways of being one of the things that interests me and I, i'm sure you can expand on this a little bit i remember being told that quite a number of the admittedly very small number of um, human remains we have from this period seem to show su subtle deformities associated with inbreeding is that correct yeah so there's a really interesting from the kind of the fossil remains that we have and as we move kind of into the, the last glacial maximum in, in Europe. There's a there's a sort of a, a cultural name that's been given called the Gravettian, where we see burial of people and they're buried with grave goods and you know, very uh, sort of um, they've got thousands of beads on some of them, which clearly would have been sewn onto the clothing uh, beforehand, representing you know many tens of thousands of hours of work here. So there's lots that we can start to kind of tease out around the structure of these societies in terms of tasks being divided up across across those groups and yes a large number of them do kind of have these subtle differences in the skeletal morphology as you suggested they, they may well be related to inbreeding and things like that but it seems that like people who had sort of differences in their skeletal morphology may have held some sort of special place within that society mm -hmm. in the way that you know other people didn't um, but we, we really don't know because the evidence yeah. that we have for it are, are, is, is literally these graves that have been dug and then sort of the, the grave goods been deposited. So we're, we're dealing with one of those classic problems in archaeology when one sees a slightly unusual specimen, which or, or one that looks unusual to our eyes, which is, is this an average member of society who has been buried normally or is this a special member of society who has been special? 
return. Exactly. And um, that's, a, that's yeah. a real problem, really, Challenge in our understanding in terms of these past human populations is that we don't really understand the range of variability within those populations. So if you think, if you think about us today, when you look around the room that you're perhaps listening this to or walking down the street, um, wherever you are, just look around you. you. People are varied. We're varied in size. We're varied in, in shape. We're varied in, in numerous different ways. And that's great. You know, there, there's a diversity to, uh, to our species. What we don't have such a clear picture of, of in the past is what that diversity and variation was in these past sort of Pleistocene populations, simply because we just don't have the fossil record in a big enough number to tell us or to give us an indicator of that variability, if that makes sense. As I say, you know, as a biologist, one thing that we will tend to know is this, which is the smaller the population of any species, um, whether it's reindeer, cave lions, mm. or us, the less the diversity there must simply be genetically. Yeah. And so I, I, what, I, what I'm picking up from you is a picture of a terribly hard life with very resourceful people spread very thin in the few places in Europe where it's still possible to extract any kind of subsistence living, hanging on through what must have been a tough old period for human existence. And then I guess what happens is, which is an ironic thing for COP26, climate change comes to the rescue and the ice melts. What happens then? Yeah, so just to, just to go back to kind of that, what life was like when people were living during the, in these refugia. I mean, it was undoubtedly hard, but there's also, you know, glimpses that people were still engaging with things like painting caves, you know, carving figurines. So their, their life was tough physically, but they were still also engaging in rituals and ideologies probably to keep their sort of society together. So it wasn't all bad necessarily, but, but probably quite tough, as you say. And then... Yeah, it's yeah. And then once we get to the end of that last glacial maximum and, and the ice melts and we move into the Holocene, what you see at the beginning, sort of in the first 5,000 years, so 15,000 to about 10,000 years ago, you get people dispersing, in Northwest Europe at least, dispersing out of these refugia and sort of moving into these areas as, as the ice retreats and flora and fauna are also expanding at the same time too. And... Actually, there's they're sort of in Northwest Europe, there's an interesting culture there called the Magdalenian, who are engraving bits of bone, engraving uh, uh, animals onto, onto cave walls and things like that and spreading out. But they're also cannibals. So they're sort of eating each other for nutritional and or maybe ritual reasons. And there's certainly bits of human bone that are kind of scraped clean skulls that are kind of curated decorations drawn onto human bone. Then around 10,000 years ago, sort of in the Middle East, we start, and possibly even longer, maybe even around 12, there's been some hints. Um, we start to see a shift perhaps in, in, in how people live from mobile hunter-gatherer systems to a more sedentary phase of living where agriculture starts to develop. And then agriculture kind of spreads out of that Middle Eastern sort of origin point, at least as far as we understand it at that, that time that we're speaking, and kind of spreads at, out across the world across there or may well have been independently innovated in a couple of periods or places around the same time and what we see there are it, it sort of is, is we move into the holocene into glacial phase which is what we are in now uh, most people kind of really think that that begins with the neolithic and this move into sedentism so we are staying in one place we're building structures villages towns there are all kinds of ideologies that go along with that kind of sedentary lifestyle, as well as the development of agriculture. So we're growing our own food uh, to feed us all, all year round. And then you start to see kind of more formalized divisions of tasks and, and um, uh, labor and things like that within society in ways that, that we are probably more, more familiar with today. And it's that kind of shift that then also allows populations to ex start to expand and grow because you are, you have reliable quality food sources that you have access to i can imagine if i was transported back in time to the late glacial maximum i would feel very lost indeed apart mm. from very cold among a society of uh, effectively hunter gatherers however if i was moved back to the neolithic 
I'd see things that looked like farms, huts that I would recognize. And it would be much more similar to the kind of sedentary life that's characterized the last few thousand years yeah. than, than the bit before, which I think is an important thing. Do we know much about um, the demography and numbers of people in the Neolithic? I can imagine that you might see a higher birth rate, for example, but you might also see a greater prevalence of infectious disease because you're now in the same place. And you, this is new and you don't have much idea of hygiene. Yeah, I mean, it was sort of slightly straying, a little bit out of, of, of my knowledge base. But yes, I mean, I think that probably is certainly the picture that you could pick up from the demography. What, what is interesting, if you think about human brain, brain size, is that our brain size continues to kind of increase really through, 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 through this period. And then it sort of drops off sharply around the kind of the last two or three thousand years and brain size starts to go down. And, and one interesting well, idea... I think many of our listeners would find that intrinsically plausible. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I think yeah, what, one of the ideas around why that might be is because we start to basically entrain um, our kind of social lives with, with rituals and things, and we can sort of start to offload, offload these kind of cognitive tasks into those behaviours. And, and the other sort of thing that Kind of strikes me when I was when I was reading this this relatively new research that came out a few weeks ago, um, was that there's also at that point we start to get writing systems taking off and being much more dominant mm -hmm. within societies. And with that kind of written, when you can write stuff down, you you don't need to basically carry it around in your brain in in your memory so much. And I wonder if there's a correlation there that might because we're offloading a lot of that cognition rather than hanging on to it. Um, yeah, I, there, there I, may I be a, a cause that, and effect yeah, there. I suppose the parallel that one might seek is that well-known observation in neurobiology that London traffic driver, London taxi drivers who famously did the knowledge mm. have enlarged brain regions around that after they've completed this extensive memorization of things yeah so if yeah. you imagine a society that has to memorize massive amounts of bits and pieces that makes sense i mean with the demography i think it's it's clear that something interesting does happen many years ago um we did a survey of skeletal remains from the western neolithic looking for who was the oldest person at death we could find okay. and uh, a colleague of mine went through 1,500 different skeletons and found one person who could be aged by the dental rings in their teeth. Yeah. And they were probably over the age of 70, which is wow. certainly a better option than um, life in the Lake Glacial. So you've got more older people, which yeah. is a trend that has continued or that we worry about now or has continued now. But what it still shows is just how poor your chances were of reaching that age. Now, if yes. you're in Western Europe, your chance of reaching the age of 70 is much better than one in two. Um, if it was the Neolithic, your chance of reaching 70 is more like one in 2000. So, you know, it, it looks like a more complex society is rather better for you. OK, so that's, that's, that's really interesting, Richard. Did um, in that study, just as it springs to mind, you know, what, what was the condition of that individual who was seventy? Did they did they look sort of worn out with like 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 the teeth missing from the Neanderthals who were kind of late thirties, or were they sort of I don't okay? Think, well, the, I don't think the teeth were in from memory. I don't think the teeth were in such bad shape. This mm. is where you're putting me on on the spot. <laughs> I'm afraid, James, because it it, it wasn't a. Uh, um, it's. I think that that is an important open question, which is, are the lives of older people easier or harder mm. as we move um, as we move across those phrases? They're certainly more common, um, but they're still fantastic. And this is very odd. Many people don't realise that they are living in a remarkable period demographically yeah. today. Yeah. By the middle of this century, there will be more old people on earth than children wow is that really wow human history 2050 there will be more people over 65 
than there are under 15, and that's globally. And I think when you look at how far we have come in such a long time, because the, um, the period through the cold period, I think we're looking at a period of what, 500, 600 generations or mm-hmm. more, and there's fewer than 100,000 people. And I doubt there were fewer, in that case, I would be surprised if there were more than a thousand human beings aged over 50 in the whole of Europe. In fact, the, even for the upper maximum. Wow. Astonishing. One of the things that comes home to me, we discussed the, the deep time, is that until recently, we were not many. Yes. And the, it goes back to our point on genetic diversity. The smaller the population, the more that diversity is lost. And this, I think, has important implications for the evolution of aging in humans. Mm. So for 600 generations, the human population has been very small in question. So 500, you know, 5,000 people. This means it's very, very powerfully affected by something that's known as genetic drift which is the loss of genetic diversity in small populations. Now, all different types of genetic diversity can be lost by drift. But what makes this particularly interesting is that aging in every species is under, evolves as a result of the action of two kinds of basic um, genetic variants. One kind, uh, um, are simply genetic variants that will kill an organism after it has reproduced, but have no effect on it before that. And we, this, is, um, this is known as mutation accumulation, mm-hmm. and it's been postulated for many years that the, it's the accumulation of these bad lethal variations that cause what we think of aging. The alternative mechanism is that there are genetic variants that give you an advantage in the struggle for existence early on in the life course when you are around, even if they do bad stuff later on. And as we've seen in the course of this discussion, it's very unusual for an animal in the wild to have much of a later on. Yeah. And we call this antagonistic biotropy. And it's clear that in each species that's been looked at, Both of these mechanisms, mutation accumulation and antagonistic biotrope, are playing a role in shaping the physiology of aging in that species. But what is clear as well is that mutation accumulation is acutely affected by genetic drift. And we as a species seem to be one of the driftiest organisms we know. And we are very, very different from the organisms that have been used in laboratories like mine to study the aging process. Flies, nematode, worms, mice, because these animals, by definition, have always been around in massive numbers. Yes. And I think that's an important thing that we need to start to test as we go forward, which is why I think understanding the demography of the Stone Age is so important. Yeah. Because whatever it was, those traces, I can guarantee, will be affecting human health today because we lived in that way for so long. So yes. by studying the past, we will understand the present. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Richard. Okay. I mean, where could our listeners go if we've interested anybody in getting up on trying to understand just the demography and the... Um, culture of the stone age are there some accessible books they could get or yes so um, again yeah a a colleague um of of mine called uh, dr jenny french at the university of liverpool has just i think just published or about to publish a book on paleolithic demography so there's a great uh, easy accessible way to, to to have a look and access that i look forward to reading that i'm i'm sure everybody who's been listening does james thank you so much for your time great thank you richard This broadcast has been brought to you by the Longevity Forum as part of Longevity Week 2021. We are very grateful to our sponsors, 
Juvenescence and Burn Break. For more podcasts, visit our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.